Beep, 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 all the new from the Jester News. Hello. <laughs> How are we this morning, this afternoon, or this evening, depending on where you are in the globe? See that I have an international audience. Please do subscribe. Finger, click, click, subscribe. And um, <clears throat> we're starting advertising for the new cohort of warrior teachers this week. So that'll be going out in the next few days. I've been doing some testing on Twitter. So join me, so, you know, subscribe, do the usual, but become a warrior teacher. Come and join us. The new co cohorts have been very fascinating and it's been very enjoyable. Now, I've got something terribly interesting for you today. Um, so I, I want to introduce you to somebody that you may have not come across before, <clears throat> but you certainly need to know about. Um, and that is the very marvellous and the very wonderful Naomi Cunningham. Now, for those of you that don't know, Naomi has uh, appeared in front of the Scottish Parliament in, to do with all this gender kerfuffle, all the GRR, and all the rubbish going on in Scotland. And on the... Um, uh, <clears throat> Scottish legal uh, website, Naomi has written uh, a tremendous article, which is, of course, in the Dubris, right? Okay, so you can read it, um, in regards to the chilling effect of Scotland's proposed gender recognition regime. And it's a very interesting read indeed. So I thought it would be, a, it would be a, a, you know, apposite that we should sit and go through it together. So let's begin. What Naomi's got to say, first of all, is... The first casualty of the gender recognition regime is freedom of speech. Now that's interesting, isn't it? What a lovely take. What a lovely take. Um, uh, oh, talking about freedom of speech, have you seen Constantin Kisson at the Oxford, you know, speakeasy thing? Oh my, he does not pull his punches. I'll see if I can put that in the dubris as well. Yeah, because I saw that today as well. Free speech is on the agenda today. So... Naomi writes, so Naomi, Naomi, Naomi writes, section 29, brackets 2, brackets D, this is obviously in legal ease, as they say, of the Scotland Act 1998 provides that an act of Scottish Parliament is not law so far is it, so far is it incompatible with any of the convention rights. Okay, so what that means is, if, if the Scottish pass a law, which is what they've done with this GRR cobblers, right? If they pass a law, and that law is not compatible with uh, the convention rights, i.e. the agreements between Scotland and other countries, that European Convention on Human Rights is a bulwark against Scotland passing something that is not in... Uh, that is not compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights. In general, now I'm not particularly a fan. The government isn't particularly a fan. I think it needs work. Um, it hasn't been worked on for a long time, but it needs work. So, as Naomi says, the UK government may not be a fan of the European Convention on Human Rights in general, but it would be a mistake for it to overlook the significance of this provision in considering its response to Scotland's gender recognition reform bill. What Naomi is adding to the pot here is another reason and another uh, valid uh, way for the UK government to go <laughs> to old wee Jimmy Cranky, okay? So the bill would amend, this is what the Scottish bill does, would amend the UK's existing Gender Recognition Act 2004 and allow anyone born in or temporarily resident in Scotland, it just gets worse, to change their sex for all, brackets, legal, brackets, purposes, right? Legal purposes. If they change their name and pronoun for three months and make a solemn promise, just unreal, isn't it? a solemn promise to live in the acquired gender for the rest of their lives. Right. <laughs> right. Mm. It significantly speeds up the process of getting a gender recognition certificate and removes the requirement for medical diagnosis, opening it up to a much larger and more diverse, diverse group of people. Name is a very lovely lady. So, a lovely woman. I don't want to say lady, it doesn't seem right anymore. Naomi is a very lovely woman, right? And a, a good, a keen legal mind. Of course, which I am not. I'm just a sort of round curmudgeon that teaches people, right? So a much more diverse group of people. Yeah, we know who they are. Fetishists. All manner of filthy people. Keep your fetish in your bedroom. Don't want to see it in Tesco's. Thanks. Right? It's all about the tits. Don't forget. So a gender recognition certificate, says Naomi, doesn't literally change your sex. It's not a magic spell, right? But it is an extraordinary powerful piece of paper. Yes, it is. It enables you to have a new birth certificate issued saying that you were born the opposite sex. This has to stop. 
Your true sex becomes protected information and it's a criminal offence for someone who learns of it in an official capacity to disclose it unless one of a very limited list of exceptions applies. So it's, it's in, you've got to lie. This is see, free speech. See, see where this is going? What a mind. See where this is going? The assumption underlying that protection seems to have been that those who were granted GRCs would normally strive to pass as the opposite sex. So mentioning their true sex would out them as trans. That's rare. Therefore, records, like your full tax record, that reveal the change were kept under special protection. But if, as will be the case for the great majority of those acquiring Scottish GRCs under the new conditions, your true sex is obvious to anyone who meets you, have you seen the AGPs? They think they pass. It's like an anorexic looking in the mirror and seeing a fat person. They look in the mirror and see a cute chick, to use their terminology, or, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a lovely girl, you know? It comes with all the paraphilias, you know, and the, and the dis whatever it is, the dysfunctions that go on with it. So, um, with that in mind, that you've got these LARPing folk that are going to do it, and the true sex is obvious to anyone who meets you, then the difference between what they see with their eyes and ears and your sex on paper may in baby information gained in an official capacity. That will create a chilling effect over communication or acknowledgement of, acknowledgement of facts that are fundamental to the safe and fair operations of women's services, to anti-discrimination laws, fair sports, and to effective safe safeguarding of children and vulnerable adults. And because GRC is treated as secret, the chilling effect will extend to anyone who asserts, asserts a cross-sex identity and inhibit, inhibit, inhibit any systematic and accurate, accurate collection of data on sex. Yep, it's that bad, OK? Now, what Naomi then says, we already know this because it's been in the pot, it's in the milieu currently, is the UK government could use Section 33 of the Scotland Act to refer to the Supreme Court the question whether the Scottish Parliament really has power to change who could be counted as man and woman for the purpose of UK laws. I don't think Sturgeon didn't know this. She knew this. There's another agenda here. Or, Naomi continues, it could issue an order under Section 35 and stop the bill by saying it has too many adverse effects on the operation of UK laws, such as the Equality Act. Now, what I didn't consider, which Naomi is obviously very well aware of, being a legal mind of uh, you know, raise a sharp insight, I thought, well, you know, I'd rather they did the second one. Naomi just simply says, or oh, they could do both. <laughs> do both! Come on, Richie. Give them a double stuff in. Do both, right? So, um, there's a briefing from um, Sex Matters, which is the organisation, um, as you know, that uh, that's uh, run by um, uh, uh, various uh, strong women in the movement, such as uh, Helen Joyce, I believe, is on the panel, and um, Maya Forstatter at the heart of that as well. Naomi works with them. So, yeah, have a look at that. That's in the links in the Dubris, right? Okay. The freedom of speech effects goes to the fundamental question of competence. Now, this is interesting. Competence has come up a lot in the last few days. I've been talking to my warrior teachers. The mechanism for changing birth certificates was considered necessary in 2004 on human rights grounds. The European Court of Human Rights in Christine Goodwin versus UK, brackets 2002, had determined that for a post-operative transsexual to have to reveal his biological sex when asked to show a birth certificate for certain administrative purposes, breached his Article 8 right to privacy. So that's one of the laws where this nonsense started. Articles 8 and 10 are both qualified. What that means is qualified, which means they can be interfered with as prescribed by law and necessary in a democratic society. So these are not, these are, these are what are called qualified rights. It's not a right, full stop, you know, whereas the right to, the right to not be a slave, for example, would be an absolute right. The Gender Recognition Act, the UK one, in its original form, sought to achieve a balance between the privacy rights of a very small group of people who were expected to have taken extraordinary steps under medical supervision to change their physical appearance and the freedom of expression of those who had official dealings with them. So, in other words, they were trying to strike a balance in order to avoid various things, including gay marriage, in order to avoid various things um, in, and to accommodate a particular very small subset of society, which... Now we know from the Swedish model and from the Norway uh, information and what's coming out from uh, in medical in terms of we know the longer term effects now of um, the uh, um, hormones that are given to people who undergo this procedure for reasons of discomfort. We now know that it causes the most te terrible troubles and terrible health problems and a far, far enhanced suicide rate. 
So that's very worrying. We need to look at that and see why. So I would assume that there won't be many of these people going forward if everybody starts to take notice of the truth. And we begin to look at what the psychological help is that can be offered. Hence, organisations like um, uh, like thoughtful therapists, etc., looking at how this can be managed to ensure that this idea of a gender identity is eradicated from this equation. So that's what they did for a very small group. Okay. The Scottish amendments would extend these protections to a much larger group with different characteristics, radically altering that balance. Yes, they would. If the new balance between Article 8 and Article 10 is not fair, then the Gender Recognition Bill is incompatible with the UK's obligation under the European Convention on Human Rights and thus beyond the competence of the Scottish Parliament. In other words... The fine line that was drawn, and I, in my mind I think it was a mistake, but in the fine line that was drawn in 2004 for the Gender Recognition Act originally, which was, um, if you read the Hansard on that, it's very interesting to see what people were saying. But what was done then in 2004, we're now some 18 years past that, 2004, was to find that fine line. What Scotland's bill does is shift the line phenomenally. I mean, the line goes altogether, because you, then you've got, you know, men who toss off to their own breasts and, you know, who think they're a woman, can then get included. Because they're not asking for anything medical. They're saying it's not medical. Being trans is innate. It's a gender identity. Now, you remember from um, the YouTube that I did yesterday, we now know it doesn't, doesn't even bloody exist, right? So it's all nonsense. It's all made-up belief. It's all nonsense. These people are deluded. Right? So, in in the, what what is and what is not covered in, in, in 8 and 10, Articles 8 and 10 of the of the um, Convention is, the, adject ne the adjective necessary, as explained by Naomi here, in the qualification of Article 10 and Article 8, implies the existence of a pressing social need. But how could there ever be a pressing social need to keep something secret that is so obvious to everyone? Right? That's a very interesting question. In the Sunday Times versus UK 1991, the European Court of Human Rights held that the UK government's injunction against the publication of extracts of spy catchers, some of us are old enough to remember this, um, violated Article 10, as the book was already published outside the UK and available by, by mail order. As Lord Brid of Harwich has pointed out in a dissenting opinion in the House of Lords, correctly anticipating the outcome in Strasbourg, it is perfectly obvious and elementary that once information is freely available to the general public, it is nonsensical to talk about preventing its disclosure. Now, that's fascinating, isn't it? That here we are, we have a story of a court case from UK law, which goes right back to 1991, where there was an attempt uh, to prevent the publication of extracts of the book Spycatcher because what was in there was, in, was embarrassing to the, the Secret Services. Well, in that particular case, it ended up being published because it was already in the public domain outside. What Naomi is saying, that, that provides impetus to the idea that you can't say that you can't talk about this bloke being a bloke despite the fact he looks like a bloke but identifies as a woman on Wednesday. I love her! I love her! Fantastic, right? <clears throat> Similarly, unless a person has taken heroic steps to change their appearance under medical supervision, and often even if they have, their sex is information that is freely available to anyone who meets them or speaks to them on the phone. Right? They're trying to make you lie. It's that simple. They're trying to make you lie. Legislating against disclosure in this situation is fundamentally unjust. It's also impossible to police. You know as well as I do, you meet somebody you know they're a bloke. You know, they're a you know, woman. It's evolution. We, you know, we know. That's why we're here. Lord Bridge continued, freedom of speech. This is again from this case about spycatcher. Freedom of speech is always the first casualty under a totalitarian regime. There we go. Oh, I never knew about Lord Bridge before, but I think I rather like him. Now, I don't know if he's still about. I'll have a look later. Freedom of speech is always the first casualty under a totalitarian regime. Such a regime cannot afford to allow the free circulation of information and ideas amongst its citizens. Censorship is the indispensable tool to regulate what the public may and what they may not know. The present attempt to insulate the public in this country from information which is freely available elsewhere is a significant step down that very dangerous road. 1991, spy catcher. You're not having it, we're publishing it, right? That, and he saw that coming and that's what Strasbourg did, the, uh, the, 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 the European court. Everyone's personal data is protected by ordinary data protection laws, Naomi continues. Spe special criminal penalties for, penalties for acknowledging a person's sex 
if they have a GRC, risks creating a totalitarian, totalitarian regime of censorship and fear in workplaces and institutions. That's what we're seeing happening already. We know this is happening, right? That regime will preclude sensible and compassionate thought about how to accommodate those who have a personal identity at variance with their sex without undermining the rights of others or denying reality. Naomi, thank you for a marvellous article and written in such a way that, to a legal nitwit like me. It is understandable and, you know, it's obviously a very considered and thoughtful article from a very considered and thoughtful person. Jester, I ain't considered and thoughtful. So let's do the last line again. Or the last sentence. Um, that regime will preclude sensible and compassionate thought about how to accommodate those who have a personal identity at variance with their sex without undermining the rights of others or denying reality. Yeah, not going with that one, Naomi. Sorry. Right, OK, sorry. You know, I don't care what your personality is. You don't get to pretend you're something or not and expect me to play along. Never going to do it. So that's me being me. You know, that's the jester going, no, we're not having it. Not having it. Right, I don't care. I'm not interested OK, so do read it. It's a tremendous article. And, and once again, thank you to Naomi for it. Um, and yeah, have a great day. I'll see you later. Keep chesting.